در بر One thing I have learned from doing scary true tales is that most people either have a tale themselves or they at least know someone who has. But what if your whole life seems to be filled with one scary story after another? Tonight, we return to Australia to hear the continuing story of a lady who has lived with the paranormal all of her life. So I mentioned that when I was in my teens, I decided that I did not want the paranormal in my life anymore. I made this decision when I was 15 and was in my first long-term relationship. The guy was into heavy metal, real heavy stuff like Pantera, Metallica, Sabbath and Iron Maiden. He used to talk about the devil and play his records backwards to show how certain ones had subliminal messages on them. With me seeing spirits every now and then, I started to freak out. Big time. I was on the train one day with my friend around this time. We were heading back to my place and through what is called the city loop round here. It's all underground through the city of Melbourne and I was talking to my friend. It was pitch black out the window so it meant you could see the reflection of everyone in the cab. As I looked at her reflection I saw there was an old man sitting right next to her. I turned away from the window and looked at her and saw he was not there. I asked her if she had seen him, but she said she hadn't. I was starting to get down at this stage of my life, thinking I was weird or I was mentally ill or something. So I started to tell myself that none of this was real and just a figment of my imagination. A few weeks later, I was on a camping trip with a group I was involved in. Another girl in our troop helped me to set up our tent underneath a tree. Later that night, it rained hard. We both jumped into our sleeping bags around 10pm and we were talking as girls do, listening to the rain hit the sides of our tent. The tent had a waterproof bottom so we thought it would be okay for the night. We were talking still when I heard a male voice say, Get out of the tent! I didn't mention that I had heard the voice but I said to the other girl that I didn't feel right about being in the tent using the rain as an excuse for us to leave and find another tent to sleep in. Our group leader came over to us and gave us a big speech about the late time and asked us why we were out of our tent. She marched us back over and as we bent over to get into the bottom of the tent there was nothing but water. Our sleeping bags and clothes were now all wet and the leader saw this so helped us to find another place for the night. Needless to say it was all good in the morning and we packed up and went home that Sunday afternoon. But it was only two weekends later when we heard that two young boys had been killed at the very same camping spot. A tree fell on their tent through the night, killing them instantly. It was all over the news. The girl I shared the tent with rang up and asked if I had seen the news to which I said yes. And at our troop meeting, it was all we talked about. It was because the exact place where the two boys were was exactly where we set the tent up two weekends before. This was all getting too much for me to deal with, and I kept saying to myself, I don't want to know anymore. Whenever I saw or heard anything, I just kept thinking that it was my imagination. I could almost feel my third eye closing, like it was shutting down inside my mind. It worked. For a while at least. When I was 17, I decided to move into a house with my friend. She had a small baby at the time. I had always stayed with my friends and my boyfriend so this was all new to me to pay rent and bills on my very own place that I could call home. The very first night I moved in, I started to hear things. A running sound would begin at 10pm every night, thump 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 from the front door, down the hallway and all the way to the back door. The first time it happened we just stood frozen looking at each other thinking, what the fuck? That first week, it got to the point where we just stopped what we were doing and just waited for it to start. We would sit down on the couch together as it felt safer that way. The thing was, her little one would wake up at the same time which had us freaking out even more. I mentioned to my friend that it felt like my bed was moving through the night. It had wheels on the bottom and the floors were wooden. On the third night, I woke up on the other side of the room. I ran out of my room that morning, 
and we decided to invite people over to witness this so we could be sure that it wasn't just us being paranoid females. So every night for the next two weeks we had a house full. Everyone heard it and would talk about the running noise, trying to figure out what it might be or what we could do about it. The day I turned 18, we had been living there almost three weeks, and I still wasn't used to the running sound. It still freaked me out to the point of tears every night. My housemate Carista was shaking with nerves and trying to settle her baby Alicia. There were three others in the house too that night all talking about our problem. I had decided to go to bed at 11pm as I had to be up early the next day. I went into my bedroom and noticed that my touch lamp was going crazy. It had three settings where it would start dim and go lighter before it turned off. It did this all night. I was already scared but this just increased my fear. As I lay in bed, I felt it start to move. It only usually happened when I was asleep but not this time. I watched as the bed moved from the left side of the room to the right, with me in it. That was enough. I jumped up and ran for the door and tried to push it open, but I felt a pull like something wanted to keep me in the room. I screamed for help and Carista's boyfriend came and grabbed my hand and pulled me into the hallway. I ran into the lounge and almost jumped into Carista's lap. I was that scared. She kept asking me, what's going on? What's going on? And she looked all freaked out at my reaction. Just then, the phone rang. It was screwed to the wall just outside the lounge room archway. Carista got up and answered it. And all I can remember is that she screamed and threw the phone down. She then ran to pick up the baby and came back, looked at me and said, let's go. I don't know what happened on the phone, and I didn't ask, but we got the hell out of there. We refused to go back in for our stuff, so our boyfriends went back the next day and packed it all up for us. We never returned to the house, but we did go and see the landlord together. I really didn't know what we should tell him, so we just said that we couldn't live there anymore. His reply was, You two are the third lot of tenants to move out within three weeks. Can I ask honestly why that is? I told him it was most likely very haunted due to the experiences we had. He was very good about us moving out so suddenly, and he said he might as well have it demolished. He did so just a few months afterwards. Carista never did tell me what was said in that phone call, even after I must had the courage to ask her, but it's something I will never forget. A few years later I went to see a clairvoyant. She said that all I had to do to stop seeing or hearing things is to state your intent that you don't want to. And that's exactly what I did. The house we lived in scared me so much that it was exactly what I wanted. Oh, by the way, I always make sure I take the wheels off my bed whatever house I am living in now. For a good while, I had zero interest in getting back into the world of the paranormal, but the more I spoke to people about my experiences, such as when I rented that house and hearing other stories, I began to get sucked back in again. As me and my boyfriend drifted apart, I found that I started to see and hear things again. I think that due to my mindset at the time, and him playing the records backwards to hear the subliminal recordings really messed me up so I was starting to open up again now, and I could relax more. I don't know, maybe it was just the universe's way of getting me to dump the guy or something. But it just never seemed as bad as when we were together. I started to meditate and to watch out for signs or omens. I think being older and wiser helped too. But what really brought me back into the world of the supernatural was when I met my friend Laura who was a spiritualist medium. She is a sort of a spiritual mentor for me nowadays. But what it was, is that when she was talking to me about spiritualism, it would bring back memories from when I was very young about my grandma, or Bukchar as I would call her in Polish. My grandma would say things like, you should believe in spiritualism and ghosts because they are real. Don't question what's in front of your eyes because it's not a trick. I would be sitting with Laura and memories would come flooding back just like that. It's funny how you forget what you learn as you grow older. In the year 2002, my grandma was sick. She had early onset Alzheimer's and must have had it for a long time by the time it was diagnosed. She kept having mini strokes and we were told she wouldn't have much longer left outside of a care home. I decided I wanted to see my grandma before she came worse, so I flew out to Tasmania where she lived with my pops to spend some time with her. I had a better relationship with my grandparents than my parents and I didn't want to have the guilt of not seeing her one last time for the rest of my life. 
One day, when I was there, I was at the sink washing up and listening to Grandma nattering on. I had to really listen, because she would get confused and switch languages. She would be talking English, then lapse into Polish in the next sentence. So I'm just listening and trying to keep up with the language changes when I notice someone or something standing in the garden under a small tree. It's semi-transparent and it looks like it could be a woman of some description. I'm mentally telling myself it's not real when my grandma says my name. She hadn't called me by my real name in a while. She would usually call me by my aunt's name and think I was her at a younger age. She says, Sweetheart, did you see my mother out there? She is waiting for me to come to her. She is coming to take me home. Can you see her? I know what I thought I had seen, but I shook my head and said I hadn't. I told her she shouldn't talk like that because she wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. She just looked at me and said, It won't be long now. She then instantly seemed to go back into her confused state, speaking half English, half Polish. It wasn't long after that when she took a rapid turn for the worse and went downhill before passing away in her sleep at home. I was so upset for my own selfish reasons that I didn't want her to die, but the thought of her mother waiting for her and that she wasn't afraid to die because of it gave me great comfort. So nowadays, I live in this house in Queensland. It's one of those houses you hear about in horror movies where electrical equipment just breaks or doesn't work. I have been through four separate mobile phones in the last few months. You're talking brand new models out of the box. My lamps, kettles, anything just blows. You're probably thinking I have faulty wiring, but I have had electricians come out and check my wiring, and they're always left scratching their heads. My electricity bills are through the roof too. It's not even like we have air corn or a heater, which makes it even more difficult to understand. I have trouble taking pictures a lot of the time. I tried to take one of the kids riding their bikes in the yard, but every time it came out blurred like I was shaking it round or something. I hate this house if I'm honest. It's hard to get a full night's sleep here. Me and my two children have heard whispering coming from empty rooms. My kids often hear people talking to them when there's no one there, and sometimes get poked or prodded by invisible hands. One night I heard what sounded like a chair rocking to and fro in the hallway. I started to hear noises coming from the bathroom, and I asked Laura about this. She said that she felt that there was the spirit of an old man trapped here, probably an aborigine. This would make sense as my house is built on old aboriginal bushland. She taught me how to help spirits cross over, and said I should do this next time I hear a noise coming out of there. I did just that, but it took two attempts before the noises stopped coming from the bathroom, but I filmed the first attempt. On the video, it appears that there is an old man standing in front of the mirror, and as I am carrying out the ritual, it affects my camera and you can see it on the video. Have a look, and see what you think. Anyway, recently I have found weird things happening in my house that were really a huge step up from the activity we have experienced there before. There's always been little things happening here, but nothing like this. Things were being moved around, my fridge door was left open and books would be thrown all over the floor. Now I've had so much experience in the paranormal that I knew something was just so wrong with this. Sure, it can increase over time, but this was ridiculous. I began to have my suspicions. Thanks to one of my neighbours I learned that my ex and his mate have been breaking into my house. He always used to make fun of me to his friends about my history with ghosts and ghouls. He was always explaining stuff away that happened when he was around. I think that when he was breaking in, him and his mate would even use the shower, as it was often wet when I got home. I decided it would be a good idea to try and catch him out. I put some bleach and hot pink hair dye into the shampoo and conditioner. So later that day... I pulled up into my driveway, and as I got out I heard a male voice shout, BITCH! I went to the bathroom and sure enough the floor of my shower was all pink. 
I nearly peed myself laughing. Hopefully that taught the stupid bugger a lesson, but I'm not sure if he can fix stupid. Anyway, this is by no means my whole story. I would need all the time in the world to share that with you all. But there was one thing that really sticks with me now. It was something that caused me to believe that me and my family were physically ill. Of all things, it was a doll. And its name was Harold. My story takes place at the Erlanger Hospital in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Ever since I was born, I had problems. I was born sick, and ever since then I would be going back and forth from my home to the hospital. Believe me, when I say I have seen some things that will make you cry, that would make you scream, that would make you shout. Every time I got sick, I went to the emergency room in Chattanooga. Mind you, this was at a time before they gave you your own room in the emergency ward. So at the time, I would have to share the room with another patient, and I remember this one poor boy who shared the room with me in the opposite bed. He was in a terrible accident and had been brought in after me. He had a broken collarbone, two broken ribs, and his legs were shattered beyond belief. I still remember that night just like it was yesterday, the screams of pain and agony that came from him. They tried everything to sedate him, but nothing seemed to work. After hours of screaming and pain, it just stopped. The only sound left was the machine monitoring his heart, making a constant beep sound. It meant only one thing. His heart had stopped. That same night, I was committed into the hospital for surgery. As they took me up to my room, I thought about that poor kid. Even to this day I think about him. But that's not the weird part. When they brought me to my room, I noticed there was barely anybody on the floor. It was quiet. So quiet you could hear a pin drop. As I got settled into my room, I found out why my floor of the hospital was so quiet. The nurses told me that all the rooms were booked in, and this was the only room, as the other rooms were being developed. She told me why it was so deathly quiet there. I happened to share the same floor with the morgue, Yes, the same place where they store the bodies. This did not bother me too much though because at the time my parents were morticians and had a funeral home. The nurses and doctors came to check on me and gave me something for the pain so I could sleep. I was just drifting off to sleep when I heard footsteps muffled but very loud. I got up from my bed and went to see who it was and I noticed a small child and a young woman. The child was no older than two years old and the young woman looked to be in her late twenties or early thirties. As I watched them, they were walking towards the morgue. I didn't see anything of it. Maybe they were going to visit one of their loved ones one last time before they send them to the funeral home. I noticed the looks on their faces. Normally the look on someone's face when they walk into a place as such will be a look of sadness. But this was more of a look of despair. As they finally went in, I waited and watched the door to see if they would come back out. I waited hour upon hour. Eventually though, I passed out, and the next morning the doctor came in to check on me to see if everything was alright. As the doctor was talking to me, telling me how to take better care of myself, I asked him a question. I said, excuse me doctor, but who were those people that were on the floor last night? And the doctor looked at me, and then at the nurse, and the nurse looked at the doctor. And he said, son, there were nobody on this floor except for you. He said, could be you were seeing things. Well, I shook my head in disbelief and said to myself, it had to be real. I saw them. I saw them. It wasn't until later that they brought in the newspaper for me to read. And as I was flipping through the paper, I was looking through the columns. And what I saw made, there was a hit and run the night before. And two people had died instantly. I rubbed my eyes to make sure I was not seeing what I saw. The two people who died that night were a young woman and her child. The same woman and child I saw walking into the morgue. Hello everyone, it's the Batman here. And I'm just taking a really deep breath after that. There was just so much in it and I felt really wrapped up in it all. 
But anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please remember to subscribe for more. If you like this show, you will probably enjoy my other show called Uncle Creepy Tells Your Tales. Next week, Uncle Creepy will be bringing you a Halloween gore fest. Also, keep an eye out for the Star Bible narration. The Star Bible is a work in progress by a science fiction writer called Megan Creech. And we are doing the first three chapters as a teaser. If, if you do enjoy the first two chapters, then keep an eye on your inboxes because we will be in touch with you soon. Thank you everyone for watching. I'm Creepy Battenberg saying goodnight and sweet dreams.